The first thing that probably springs to mind when you think of the internet is probably a wireless connection. On the other hand, the reality is quite different. In this video, we will discuss everything pertinent to the internet that you need to be aware of. Where it all began, how the internet itself operates, and what the prospects are for its further development. Who owns all of those millions of kilometers of underwater cable, and how exactly are they laid? How they prevent deadly shark attacks on such lines and how they repair any damage that may have been caused. But before we go on with the rest of the video, you can subscribe to our channel, The Talking Telegraph, so you don't miss any other videos that are as interesting as this one. These days, our connections to the internet are always active, around the clock. Our internet connections are dependent on thousands of kilometers of underwater cables that go in a crisscross pattern across the seas of the whole globe. Despite the fact that everything appears to suggest that we are heading towards a world that is more wireless. How exactly does this infrastructure function, and how crucial is it for us to be able to access services like Google, Facebook, or WhatsApp almost everywhere on the planet? A vast underwater network of cables crisscrossing the ocean makes it possible to share, search, send, and receive information around the world at the speed of light, according to data from Google. A vast underwater network of cables crisscrossing the ocean makes it possible to send and receive information around the world at the speed of light. Optical fiber is used in the construction of these lines. They are not very thick, but within there are hundreds of filaments the thickness of a human hair, explains Teresa Babas, regional director for Southern Europe at De6. Of course, they are covered by layers of various materials. More than 150 years ago, Work on laying cables across the Atlantic Ocean to support the expansion of the telegraph network started. At the tail end of the 20th century, the adoption of fiber optics brought about a genuine revolution in the use of this kind of cable. This change was brought about by the deployment of fiber optics. According to Babas, nowadays they may be found all across the world and link continents that are located a great distance apart along the ocean bottom. There are more than 420 undersea cables across the globe with a total length of around 1.3 million kilometers, according to one source. On some interactive maps, all of the underwater cables that have been laid down in various locations across the globe are shown. One website that offers information on the date that each cable started sending data, its length, and the corporations who control it is the submarine cable map. According to Babas, only Southern Europe has connections with 45 undersea cables. 10 of which link to Spain and 9 of which connect to Portugal, and another 6 of which are now in the process of being installed. According to the information provided by the specialist, one half of these newly installed cables will also reach the peninsula. For instance, one that is now being set up by Google and is known as Grace Hopper will establish a connection between the United States, the United Kingdom, and Spain. Now that we have that out of the way, let's talk briefly about network downtime. How does the network become unavailable? Hurricane Sandy made landfall on the east coast of the United States in 2012, triggering an estimated $71 billion in damages and knocking down numerous critical exchanges where underwater cables connected North America and Europe. The hurricane brought to our attention a possible obstacle in the process of consolidating transatlantic cables, which all landed in New York and New Jersey, we said. However, in the vast majority of cases, Nature is not to fault when a cable is severed. Every year, there are around 200 incidents of this kind, the great majority of which are brought on by human error. According to Tim Strong, Vice President of Research at Telegeography, a telecommunications market research organization, two-thirds of cable failures are caused by inadvertent human activity, such as fishing nets and trawling, as well as by ships' anchors. Strong's statement was made by Telegeography. The second greatest category is natural catastrophes, which are caused by Mother Nature and may include earthquakes as well as landslides that occur underwater. According to Strong, the fact that the majority of people are not aware of these shortcomings is due to the fact that the whole business is created with it in mind. Businesses that have a significant reliance on subsea CA it is essential to prevent connection failures in order to maintain a strong and stable connection almost anywhere in the globe. According to Babas, these cables are indispensable for the transmission of a substantial volume of data with a very minimal degree of lag time. According to Google Cloud, today, having a dependable, robust, and high-capacity network is more crucial than ever. This is particularly true in light of the fact that we are facing a new digital normal as a result of the COVID-19 problem. 
According to Babas's explanation, despite the fact that submarine cables cross the seas, these connections do not always terminate at the coastline. They continue across land in order to link to data centers, which create the physical space for holding data, or to interconnection points, which are convergence locations for content networks, internet service providers, and other enterprises. To put it another way, undersea cables are merely one of the linkages in the internet ecosystem, despite the fact that they are an essential aspect of the internet. Let's go a bit further and find out how the ocean cables gets laid. According to Clatterbuck from Seacom, laying a cable is a procedure that takes a number of years and costs millions of dollars. The procedure starts with analyzing nautical charts to determine the most efficient path. In deeper water, cables are less likely to be damaged because they are able to lie on a seabed that is generally flat and are less likely to be disturbed by rocks or other obstacles. Clatterbuck was of the opinion that the greater the depth, the better. When you are able to bury the cable in water that is deep enough, you seldom run into any complications. It sinks to the bottom of the seafloor and remains in that position forever. As you move closer to shore, you'll find that things grow more challenging. As a cable that is just a few millimeters thick on the bottom of the ocean makes its way to the landing station that will connect it with the internet backbone of the nation, it must be armored against its surroundings. Clatterbuck compared the pair of fibers to an extremely thin garden hose by saying, imagine a lengthy garden hose inside of which are very little tubes that hold a very, very thin fiber pair. This house is covered in copper, which acts as a conductor for the direct current that powers the cable and its repeaters. The voltage that runs through the cable may reach up to 10,000 volts. He said that the fibers are first coated in urethane, then wrapped in copper, and then coated in urethane once again. If we're going to have to place that cable on a beach that's extremely shallow and has a lot of rocks, then you're going to have to armor coat that cable so that no one can hack through it, I said. In more hostile environments, cables may need to be far more robust than garden hoses, protected by additional layers of plastic, Kevlar armor plate, and stainless steel so that they cannot be severed. The cable providers may also be required, depending on the coastline, to construct concrete trenches far out to sea in order to bury the cable and prevent it from being damaged by rocks by tucking it into the trench. Now that we have reached this point, it is of the utmost importance for all of us to find out whether or not the information that we are sharing over these ocean caves is even secure. The act of tapping into wires submerged in water is not a novel concept. During the time of the Cold War, American submarines would send divers equipped with specially built equipment to the Sea of Okhotsk, where they would attach this equipment on Soviet cables in order to intercept all communications. The covert monitoring was carried out for over a decade until information about the program, which was given the codename Ivy Bells, was provided to the Soviets by Ronald Pelton, who had previously worked as a communications expert for the National Security Agency. According to Telegeography, more than 99% of all international communications are sent by fiber optic cables, the majority of which are buried deep below the ocean surface. It was not a simple task to tap the underwater phone lines, but monitoring the contemporary fiber optic connections is an even more difficult task. However, it is not impossible. Thank you for watching this video. To watch more such valuable insights, make sure to subscribe our channel, The Talking Telegraph.